Welcome to Lake Imboro National Park. This will be our last adventure on our way back to the airport. We have a few exciting stops to make along the way. If you're here to get the travel tips that we have for self-driving Uganda, you can just skip forward to the middle of the video and learn all that you need to know about traveling to this beautiful country. It is so nice to go from a crazy, bumpy, muddy road that we've been slipping and sliding on to a nice paved road. I've been thoroughly impressed by what people are able to fit on the back of their scooters. We've seen up to four people riding. We've seen livestock like lambs and pigs. We've seen furniture like beds and benches and chairs. And we've seen all types of produce. I'm so, so impressed. We are here with our last 24 hours or so here in Uganda, and we are at Lake Umburo National Park. While we're here, we're staying at Hyena Hill Lodge, and it is a beautiful property. They actually just opened in 2019 before COVID, so they're still building and adding on to it, and I can't imagine what it's going to look like in a couple years, but amazing views, and it looks super open and beautiful. We are not even in the national park yet, but we've seen our first Ugandan zebra. It was just standing in the middle of the road. Oh, there's a ton of them. Can you see it? There he is. Yay, zebra. Yay. There have not been zebras in any of the national parks we've been to yet. And I really, really like zebras. They're like my second favorite safari animal besides a leopard. The park here surrounds the big lake, so it's got a little bit of different animals. It is about halfway between Bwindi and Kampala, so we're actually on our way back to the airport, but we're staying here for the night to break up the drive. Excited to squeeze in one last safari before leaving Uganda. Although we haven't seen any really big cats or anything like that so far, we have seen a lot of new animals that we hadn't seen before. And the views are incredible. There's a lot of viewpoints and lakes that we can stop at and just relax. So kind of nice to not have to drive around all the time and just enjoy the scenery. Closing down the pop top for the last time here. Wrapping up our final safari day here in Uganda. But I think we have one last short stop before we cut this thing off. Ciao for Orlando, it's a bad stuff. I'm like, you know what, I just, you know. One of the things that you can do here at, in Uganda is stop at the equator. Well, we just wrapped up our two weeks in Uganda, and now we are here at the Protea Marriott Hotel, right next to the airport to uh, get some quick rest. It's a really nice room. We got upgraded, and it's right along Lake Victoria. 
And because we had a little bit of a challenge finding out information before we got here, we thought we would make a quick tips video, just some things that we wish we had known before, things that we've learned since being here. And if you want to see like more of our whole trip, there's a ton of other videos you can go back and watch before this. We self drove through Uganda for the past two weeks and here are some of the tips that we have to share. So I think the first thing to consider is whether you want to drive yourself or hire a guide. If you're comfortable driving in another country and have experience doing it, I definitely say it's doable. We were successful and didn't run into any major issues. And do keep in mind that they do drive on the left side of the road. So if you're from somewhere that drives on the right, that's a little bit getting used to, but it's not too bad. Also, the roads are sort of a combination of paved roads and then dirt, gravel roads, and there's tons and tons of potholes. It can get slippery when it rains. And so just be ready for a bumpy ride. I think the bumpy ride is gonna come whether or not you're self-driving, but something to keep in mind. Definitely. And there's also tons of motorbikes that we've realized in some of the bigger towns. It's constant traffic. People are, you know, zooming in and out. Um, but we did figure out that the larger your car is, the more right of way you have when going through a roundabout. So that's something to keep in mind and just kind of have to ignore some of the other people zooming around you and know that they will not hit you. <laughs> Google Maps is what we use to navigate the entire country, which we will advocate for uh, all the time, and it was really fantastic and helpful. Do keep in mind, it doesn't always maybe choose the best route. I think it chooses the most direct route, which could include some bumpy roads, and maybe there was an option highway to go somewhere different. So we found ourselves on some backcountry areas that maybe don't see a lot of tourists, but we made it through easy. Definitely, and they are still working on a lot of road work here. We noticed there was a lot of construction, and so I think there will be more and more paved roads as they continue to develop that. Um, but in addition to Google Maps, we always recommend on every trip just downloading the offline Google Maps because it makes navigating so much easier when you don't have internet. You can still pull up and kind of see where you are. Um, and then also we found that in the safari parks and the national parks, you could actually look at the satellite view required internet, but you could look at the satellite view and you could see all of the different park roads which weren't always visible on the regular Google view. Speaking of safari, if you've never done safari before, you can still actually self-drive Uganda and then at each park entrance there's an opportunity to hire a guide. So that's something I think about $30 a day. It's through the Uganda, Uganda Wildlife Association that covers everything. And so you can actually just hire one at the gate and that can help you with the whole spotting animals or navigating the safari parks. And we didn't end up doing that, but they do also sell uh, park maps at each of the gates. So you can ask them for it if they don't offer it. Um, we only ended up getting it at Queen Elizabeth because they kind of showed us all of them. And I would recommend the Queen Elizabeth map because they have an Ishasha section that shows all of the lion trees, which came in super handy to know exactly where to look to find the tree climbing lions. Another last tip we have sort of on the driving navigating, if you are comfortable driving yourself and you want to drive yourself on safari, uh, you can. And a tip that we've always found successful is basically just follow the other cars. So we did spot some things on our own. We had some lion sightings, some leopard sightings when no one else is around. But if you're driving and you see a bunch of cars stopped, it's usually a good indication that there's something to see. Or if you see a caravan flying through the park all in one direction, go ahead and follow them because they're probably going to something cool. And one last tip, unfortunately, that we had encountered while driving, actually, I think three times, um, is that you probably will end up getting pulled over. They have tons of police checks. A lot of times they just wave you through, um, or they might stop you and just smile, ask you where you're from. Um, but we did have three separate instances where we were pulled over and they asked for our identification and then claimed we had done something wrong. Yeah, I, I mean, whether or not we were like a few kilometers over the speed limit, we were totally going and following everything else everyone in traffic was doing. Basically, what those traffic officers or police officers and military were looking for was a bribe. So the first time we got stopped, uh, they were pretty outright like, oh, it costs this much for the ticket. You have to go pay it in this location. And what we had read online previously and what worked for us both times was sort of just playing ignorant or dumb and we actually the second time legitimately didn't have any money and so we told them that and basically after five minutes of back and forth they let us go and oftentimes they say oh you have to go over to this area this bank this spot to go pay and then they say 
well, I don't know, what can I do? What can you do for me? What should I do here? Kind of fishing for something. And, and one woman actually even asked us for food at one point, like, well, do you have a snack for me? <laughs> um, and then, like Kyle said, we kind of just were like, I don't know, like, what are we supposed to do? Should we call our company? Like, what do we do? I don't know. And, and they ended up just letting us go and giving us our license back and told us to have a good time. So all in all, it worked out. I think you had read that maybe you could give like a small amount, but... Yeah, if you felt like you needed to, you could probably have some cash on the side for that, but I think for the most part you'd be okay. And this isn't to scare you, we probably went through like 30 police checks maybe in the two weeks we were maybe here and more. we got stopped three times, yeah. and only twice was them asking for a bribe. Like we said before, you can um, hire a guide for them to drive you the entire trip, your entire time in Uganda, and they will drop you off at your lodges and walk you through all the safaris and get you where you need to go. Um, super helpful because they are very knowledgeable and can give you all the information you need and kind of help you navigate everything that <laughs> we probably struggle to navigate. Um, or like we said, if you want to self-drive, you can get a guide at each park. So that's helpful when you're trying to spot animals. Yeah, I think had we not done three previous safaris, including one, our very first one with a guide, where we could like ask all those questions about animals and learn tips like, uh, you know, what time to go out and where to look. And if you see animals looking in one direction, like look in that direction, that really helped us out to kind of know what to look for. And if you've never done it before, I think we would both recommend hiring a guide. Um, but regardless of whether or not you hire a guide, be prepared for people to get in your car. There were multiple times when we were either a little lost and someone was like, oh sure, I'll help you, very kind, and would hop in and drive us, like tell us where to go. Um, or people from our lodge would get in our vehicle to take us to um, the check-in at the national park gate. So whether or not you hire a guide, you're probably going to have a local person getting in your vehicle at some point. All very friendly. We never had anything scary like people trying to climb in or anything. It was always a conversation. Um, so people are very friendly and are re really willing to help, especially as you get outside of Entebbe and Kampala. Um, all of those small towns are very accommodating. So I think that covers all of our sort of driving related tips. We do have some other things that we wanted to share. The first thing is there are virtually no restaurants when you're out at sort of like the main tourist areas because everything is managed in the lodge. So if I know we were kind of looking like, oh, where do we eat every night or every day? And we couldn't really figure out any details. And it turned out really pretty much everyone eats at their lodge, at least for breakfast and dinner. And we actually ended up doing a lot of our lunches, like packed lunch, and we'll talk about that in a bit too. But really, if you're uh, looking up where to eat, things like that, probably going to be at the lodge which all had amazing food yeah we actually talked to one of the chefs at the lodge and he was asking us where we get our produce at home and we told him a supermarket and he was not bragging but sharing how they get it from the local stalls it's all very fresh produce locally sourced and so you could tell i mean everything was so delicious we had fruit at almost every meal and it was so fresh and so great um, so the food at the lodges were all really good if you are wanting to pick up some food, which we'd recommend, I think, if you're going on a self-drive, just to have some snacks or maybe some sandwich stuff, we would say that you probably want to stop at the grocery store in Entebbe as you're leaving the airport area. Uh, we didn't really see anything more than like super local markets or maybe gas stations that were along the route. And the gas stations did have some stuff there, but it was really helpful for us. We stopped at one of the supermarkets or grocery stores here in Entebbe and we stocked up on all of our like food and snacks and everything that really lasted us the whole trip. And, as I mentioned, there were days when we were out on game drive the entire day, and so like having snacks or having food in the car was really helpful for us uh, to not always have to depend on the lodges or finding something to eat otherwise. And another thing that I think almost all the lodges offer is a packed lunch. So if you're leaving super early in the morning for a game drive or you're planning to be out at lunch, they can pack you a little to-go bag. Um, so that's really helpful when you're on the move. And just doubling down, the food from the lodges was like 10 out of 10. We loved it. So good. Of course, uh, if you do need a SIM card, uh, you can get one of those at the airport too. And it does seem like it's really helpful because the um, internet and everything, even at the lodges, it has been kind of spotty. I'm sure that depends on sort of what your budget accommodation, budget for accommodations is. But we found the internet to be like kind of slow. And so it can be helpful if you're needing to do any research or anything on the fly to definitely get a SIM card and have that with you in your phone for planning. So when we went to Murchison Falls, we didn't realize that we were going to have to drive through the park to get to our lodge, and that's actually the case at a few places. So as soon as you enter the park, you have to pay for a 24-hour permit 
and even if you're just driving through. And so when we got to Murchison Falls, we actually didn't realize we had messed up our timing a little bit. And so we ended up having to buy an additional permit, which was $100, um, a little bit more than we were planning. We were able to slip in another game drive and it saved us about an hour on the drive. So it made it worth it. Um, but just think about that if, as you're planning your drive, try to figure out when you're planning your game drives and when you wanna leave each place. And the permits were actually 24 hours. Like the minute you went in, they wrote it down and then you had until that moment to leave. And there were pretty much checks at all of the gates that we went to. So consider that for your planning purposes too. Even if you're just budgeting for permits, if you're planning morning drive this day and night drive this day, think about how long those permits will last because that's gonna impact your budget and when you can enter and exit the park. And speaking of permits, um, we realized that you need to buy the chimp permit and gorilla permits in advance because those do fill up, especially the gorilla permits. Um, definitely wanna buy those in advance. It's best to figure out where you're going to be staying and arrange it through the lodge. They can actually help you buy your permits for the day you need. With the chimp permits, you actually can't even buy them directly. You have to go through a travel provider. If you're doing a self-drive or if you're taking a guided tour, you can also have that company help you book them on the days you need. But basically you need someone here in Uganda to help you book those two permits. And we really found that anybody we worked with from the lodges was like more than willing to help in providing information or helping you get those things. It just maybe wasn't always as concrete as we would expect uh, from other places, but it all totally worked out. And it seemed like there was just a lot of flexibility. I mean, there was a time when we didn't have the cash to pay for our chimp permits, but they let us do the chimp trekking and then we paid after. So I think there's a pretty good understanding working with the tourists as well. Definitely utilize your lodging to ask questions if you're not sure about something. Um, the answers might not be totally clear, uh, especially through email, but you do get more information. So talking about the lodging, uh, again, all of the lodges we stayed at, we really enjoyed. So if you go back and watch our videos and looking for recommendations, you can find, I think, a short review on each of them within each of those videos. But if you're looking for more help on lodging, the UWA website uses, uh, actually lists like budget, mid-range, and luxury accommodations. So you can find out a little bit more and maybe that'll help you to determine what is the best fit for you. Um, we use the UWA website as well as like booking.com for a majority of our stays and that was really helpful in us just finding more information about the lodges, but there really just aren't a ton of reviews out there and not a lot of information. So you have to do some research and I think we stayed mostly in what was listed as like budget accommodations and they were the equivalent to what we'd expect of like five star service <laughs> everywhere and we loved it. Yeah, the staff were so accommodating. Everyone was so friendly and nice. Um, so definitely a superb service and I would even say it felt like mid-range. Everything was really um, just comfortable and, and I felt very well taken care of. You can buy your permits uh, for each of the national parks at the gate and they do accept card. That's pretty much what we'd every time. You can actually pay for multiple days. We were kind of keeping our arrangements flexible. So we would just do 24 hours at a time, which meant we had to like wait to buy them sometimes or it took a little bit more time, but even that was pretty insignificant. So that's an option at each of the national parks too. One thing we kind of knew ahead of time, but didn't really anticipate, I think, well enough was that you should always be prepared to pay with cash. A uh, credit card is not accepted everywhere. Even where a credit card was supposedly accepted, the machines were down oftentimes. We ended up making way more ATM runs than we ever expected. The good thing is they were always, you know, within like 15 or 20 minutes from the towns, but it was just like, a little bit out of expectations i think in some places so good to have cash on hand they take um ugandan shillings everywhere and they also take us dollars in a lot of places too so maybe good to have a little bit of both on hand you can plan to have us dollars for a lot of your lodges um, especially your park permits and fees they will take usd there so if you want to come with that in hand already knowing your park fees you can do that um, and same with your permits as well for your gorilla trekking and chimpanzee trekking. Um, but I will say having a card that has no ATM fees is fantastic because of the number of times we have to go to the ATM. Um, we usually try and go at the airport because it's usually cheap and we know it's reliable and safe and so we pull out cash for our trip at the airport. But this time we had to go a few more times and so it was great to have a card that would eliminate the ATM fees for us so we weren't paying exorbitant fees. 
The last thing, which I think is reflective of all of this, basically when traveling in Uganda, I would say to plan for things to not go exactly according to plan, whether it was having to get more uh, cash out or like having to find a gas station or being uncertain on some of the pertinence. It just felt like everything was kind of fluid at times. And we've had a lot of travel experiences like that. So I don't think that uh, it costs too much of a burden, but it throws you off for the first time. So I think Uganda is just one of those places that at now at least in 2022 the tourism outside of sort of like guerrilla trekking is still continuing to grow and so some of those processes are still being defined all in all we absolutely loved our time in uganda we had such an adventure like kyle said and it was a lot of there were a lot of surprises but um we really enjoyed getting to know the people and all of the animal encounters we had yeah i think to like double down on the people this is like and we say this at so many countries, but the people here were so, so nice. I mean, I talked about how the, even the budget lodges was like five star. And I think a big part of that was just like how friendly and accommodating and nice the people were who were sort of in the hospitality industry and just like talking with you and wanting to know more and wanting to help you and just do anything they can to make sure that you have a positive experience in Uganda. And they definitely left that impression on us. So I think that wraps up our uh, long series here in Uganda. Uh, if you have any other questions or anything, you can always leave a comment. And other than that, we'll see you on the next adventure. Don't forget to like and subscribe.